Um, I would like to introduce you Vera Francisco, uh, who holds a PhD with honors in sciences and health technologies from University of Coimbra in Portugal. From 2014 up to 2016, she was awarded with three Albert Reynolds Travel Fellowships from the European Society for the Study of Diabetes. Since 2017, she belongs to the Spanish National Health System, being an emergency researcher at University Clinic Hospital of Valencia. She works on the interface of metabolism and inflammation and obesity-related comorbidities towards the identification of new diagnostic and therapeutic tools. She was involved in several national and international projects, including a European Horizon 2020 project. She has a great track record of publications in high-impact journals, and she recently published a Nature Reviews Rheumatology as first author. And finally, she is a guest editor of the Biology Journal and Review of Civil Bio medical journals. <laughs> so you can start. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, thanks Sofia for the, the presentation. <laughs> well, uh, first I would like to, to thank the invitation to participate in this edition of VPH Summer School. It's an honor. Uh, I'm going to talk about the correlations between intervertebral disc degeneration and two comorbidities, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And the role of adipokines as metabolic and immune players linking these three diseases. The intervertebral disc degeneration, or EVD, is a complex, chronic, and multifactorial musculoskeletal disease uh, characterized by metabolic and structural changes on the intervertebral disc that progressively lead to the loss of its mechanical stability and shock absorber functions. The EVDD is the most important cause of low back pain, which affects 80% of the population, including me. <laughs> and is one of the leading causes of years lived with disability. And furthermore, 80% of the teens have male degenerated discs. Back pain is also a frequent cause of visits to the hospital, absence from work, hospitalizations, and surgical pressures. Moreover, it is a it a uh, multifactorial uh, etiology that hampers our understanding on disease establishment and progression, which makes the discovery of new therapies and early biomarkers really challenging. And this is important uh, because currently the diagnostic of EVDD is based mainly in imaging techniques of uh, symptomatic advanced stages of the disease, and there are no biomarkers to distinguish silence from symptomatic disc degeneration. Moreover, the management of the disease is based mainly on conservative measures like analgesics, anti-inflammatory drugs, muscular relaxants, physiotherapy or rest, and surgical intervention. This means that there is no cure and no specific uh, treatment uh, for disc degeneration. So EVDD is an unmet medical need with high socio and economic impact, poor diagnosis at early stages, no cure, and without specific treatments. So further knowledge on pathophysiology is crucial to uh, discover new diagnostic biomarkers and specific and effective therapies. The intervertebral disc has main three components. Uh, the gelatinosus nucleus pulposus in the center, the outer annulus fibrosus 
and the cartilaginous end plate that anchor the disc to the, the adjacent vertebra. The nucleus is a gel-like structure, ugly trited, due to the extracellular matrix of cells that are rich in proteoglycans that retain water. This generates an intradiscal uh, pressure to resist the, the compressive loads. And the annulus, on the contrary, is highly organized, concentric, uh, that uh, is rich in type 1 collagen with, and with reduced proteoglycans. This structure, this structure can withdraw, withstand pressurized nucleus and motion pressions of the vertebrae, namely compression, bending, flexion, torsion, and, and torsion of the spine. The nucleus and the annulus are a vascular, and the supply of nutrients, nutrients is given by marginal blood vessels and through the diffusion uh, by the cartilaginous end plate. So the sip, the, sip, the cartilaginous end plate, functions as mechanical barrier between the pressurized nucleus and the vertebral bone as, and as uh, a barrier to transport uh, nutrients and oxygen to, to the intervertebral disc. So, so the homeostasis of the intervertebral disc is dependent on the interaction of cells, extracellular matrix, and biomechanical stress. If this balance is disrupted, the cells stop producing proteoglycans. This will reduce the hydrostatic pressure and increase shear forces. An increase of the shear forces further decreases the production of proteoglycans, leading to progressive degeneration in a vicious circle. So, to keep the normal structure and thus the function of the disc, it is important to maintain the homeostasis between anabolism and catabolism. Uh, this means that we have to uh, uh, have an homeostasis in extracellular synthesis and degradation and a proper supply of oxygen and nutrients. During the degeneration of the disc, the end plate is damaged which compromise the disc nutrition and so provokes cell stress and even cell death. In fact, uh, the damage set is believed, is considered as one of the early events of this degeneration that origins or accelerates the, the process. Here we have the SIP. Uh, that controls the nutrients and the oxygen supply to the to the intervertebral disc, and if it is damaged, the this supply is compromised. So we have multiple risk factors such as genetic, aging, trauma, metabolic obesity that triggers catabolic anabolic imbal imbalance, uh, matrix degradation, proteoglycan loss, cell senescence, cell death, inflammation that leads to disc desiccation, reduced disc height, and decreased mechanical and shock absorber functions of the disc. With the degradation of the, the extracellular matrix and the appearance of the fissures in the disc, we have a vascularization of the annulus and the nucleus and the formation of vascularis, vascularized um, nucleus and, 
and annulus. This allows the migration of inflammatory cells and the increase of pro-inflammatory cytokines like EL1 beta. That contributes to the dev development of pain. At the same time, an increase in the expression of neuronal growth factors leads to the formation of sensory nerves, which also contributes to pain. So the degenerative disc is characterized by several structural and histological changes, driven by damage uh, cartilaginous end plates, inflammatory markers, and altered extracellular matrix synthesis. But what could be behind all this pathophysiological process? Uh, what's the origin? And can we prevent all this, this process? To answer these questions, for at least in part, we will see how obesity, one of the major public health problems in Western society, and one of the major risk factors for intervertebral disc degeneration, could affect this disease. Firstly, I will talk about white adipose tissue. Its functions include storage of excess energy in the form of triglycerides and the release of this energy as fatty acids for use by other organs. It has also endocrine and immune functions. Uh, it is constituted by um, mature and developing adipocytes, but also by fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and immune cells that maintain tissue homeostasis, such as macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, T, and B cells. So in Linwat, what we have is a communication between adipocytes and immune resident cells that maintain the homeostasis. In particular, Treg uh, secreted anti-inflammatory cytokines that promote M2 uh, macrophage phenotype. Overnutrition leads to the accumulation of triglycerides in the adipocytes. This expansion results in hypoxia of the adipocyte, cell stress, and apoptosis that promotes the expression of chemoattractant molecules and infiltration of immune cells. So the immune uh, profile of adipose tissue changes, the cells become activated, the reg are reduced, and macrophages switch from M2 to M1 pro-inflammatory phenotype and accumulate around necrotic areas, forming crown-like structures. This pre-inflammatory environment contributes to a decrease in insulin response in the adipose tissue, in adipocytes, but also in other organs important to metabolism, like liver and skeletal muscle, and also in vasculature. So we have a dysfunctional adipose tissue characterized by insulin resistance, pro-inflammatory environment, and regulated secretion of cytokine-like hormones, uh, called adipokines. And what are these molecules, adipokines? Are a vast family of low molecular weight bioactive peptides with pleiotropic functions as hormones and as cytokines, with both pro- and anti-inflammatory activity. The most known are TNF, EL6, leptin, and diponectin, but we have uh, furthermore. Their functions include the regulation of energy metabolism through modulation of anorexigenic and anorexigenic factors in the hypothalamus and also as modulators of the immune system. So they are considered immunometabolic players linking energy metabolism and immune system. For example, leptin, 
the first adipokine to be discovered, modulate both innate and adaptive uh, immune response, as we can see here. Therefore, adipokines have a critical role in the development of obesity and its associated comor comorbidities, including coronary heart disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, and intervertebral disc degeneration. In this case, on the one hand, uh, we have the overweight that obviously increases the, the mechanical pressure in the intervertebral disc, but as we saw before, uh, the drug-related production of uh, depokines by the the adipose tissue also contributes to systemic chronic low-grade inflammation that locally affects the, the intervertebral disc, increasing the inflammatory environment and an imbalance towards catabolic processes, which contribute to development and progression of disc degeneration. In regard to diabetes, It is known that uh, the obesity is, is uh, associated with obesity. So both chronic inflammation and the regulation of adipokine concentration could contribute to the link between uh, diabetes and intervertebral disc degeneration. But they could ha also uh, assist independent mechanisms uh, because diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance and thus hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and accumulation of uh, ages, uh, advanced glycation and products. The hyperglycemia induces the production of reactive sp oxygen species, mitochondrial stress, and premature senescence in annulus and nucleus pulposus cells decreases the autophagic mechanisms, induces the apoptosis, and inflammation and catabolism are leading to intervertebral disc degeneration. Uh, the hyperinsulinemia induces an increase in bone mineral density, leading to weight plate sclerosis, while accumulation of advanced glycation and products causes microvessel injury, both limiting the oxygen and nutrient supply to the disc and reducing the clearance of inflammatory mediators and toxins. By this way, diabetes, sorry, <laughs> which describes the co-occurrence of type 2 diabetes mellicity, mellitus and obesity results in a pro-inflammatory systemic environment that promotes insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, and increased production of adipokines, which in turn sustain the low-grade inflammation required for activation of tool-like receptors and the interaction of ages with their receptors. And these events activate multiple uh, catabolic pathways that results in extracellular matrix degradation, decreased cell viability and metabolic dysfunction at cellular level, thus promoting this degeneration. But what's the contribution of adipokines to these pathophysiological mechanisms? We, we have a summary of the, the data on adipokines and intervertebral disc, namely its effects on nuclear pulposous cells, annulus fibrosus cells, and cartilaginous end plate cells. Uh, the studies are mostly limited to a small number of adipokines. There are so many others. Uh, and to the nucleus pulposus, as you see, uh, there is little information on annulus and on SIP. And this research has largely been limited to cells and tissues from animal models or patients undergoing surgery. 
Well, before I move forward, I would like to note that the pathophysiological mechanisms linking obesity and intervertebral disc degeneration are very similar to that connecting osteoarthritis and, and obesity. And osteoarthritis is another musculoskeletal disorder characterized by articular cartilage degradation, the two imbalance towards catabolism, to extracellular matrix degradation and inflammation, just like EVDD. In osteoarthritis, you, we know that the depokines are also secreted locally by cells within the joints, such as chondrocytes, and that leptin can induce chondrocytes catabolism and it synergizes with IL-1 beta to increase nitric oxide and prostaglandins production in chondrocytes. So we postulated the following questions. Can cells from nucleus and annulus express the adipokines? Can EL1 beta affect the expression of these adipokines? Can leptin induce inflammatory and catabolic proteins in EVDD cells? And could it uh, modulate the response to IL1 beta like uh, it does in osteoarthritis? There is a synergy. Uh, synergistic effects uh, between them, and what are their differences between cells from healthy uh, and degenerated discs in, re in relation to adipokines expression and cells response to IL-1 beta and leptin. To analyze these questions, we obtained intervertebral disc cells from healthy subjects and in these discs, we are able to physically separate nucleus cells from annulus fibrous cells. Or we obtained cells uh, from intervertebral uh, tissues of patients with radiological evidence of advanced disc degeneration and subjected, subject, I, subject, so, <laughs> sorry subjected to, to vertebral fusion. And we made gene expression profile by real-time RT-PCR, by stim of unstimulated cells, cells stimulated with L1, 1 beta, and leptin alone, or a combination of both. Concerning to the expression of adipokines, we have selected uh, seven adipokines whose expression were not previously investigated in the disk or whose available data are limited. Furthermore, we analyzed the expression of LIP2 that was a recently described endogenous antagonist of ghrelin receptor. We found that both healthy nucleus cells, the white ones, I don't know if I could point, no. Well, we found that both healthy nucleus cells, the white bars, and annulus cells, the grease uh, bars, expressed all the analyzed adipokines, having serpin 2, granulin, and nuc P2, the agus expressions. And comparing the nucleus and annulus cells, we verified no difference uh, on gene expression between them. And in cells from degenerated discs, we verified the reduction in the expression of LIP2, lipocalin uh, 2, and ghrelin, uh, but in the case of ghrelin, it is not statistically significant. The expression of other uh, of the other analyzed adipokines is similar, comparing healthy and degenerative discs. We also analyzed the expression of inflammatory mediators and metalloproteinases. As we can see. There is no difference between nucleus and annulus in healthy cells, 
nor between degenerative and healthy disc cells to all these mediators. So it could be hypothesized that there are other sources of pro-inflammatory mediators in degenerative discs, likely infiltrating immune cells. Here we can see a heat map representing those data, the, the expression of different uh, genes within a sample. Each column represents a gene and and each line represents the sample. Violet and blue tones represent lower expression, and green, yellow, and red tones indicate higher gene expression. As you can see, uh, TNF and IL-1 beta had the lowest expression, while granulin and serpent uh, are the most expressive genes. Furthermore, you can see that the, the gene expression pattern is quite similar between healthy nucleus and annulus cells and degenerative discs, except for uh, LIP2, lipocalin 2 and ghrelin, as we have seen before in the graphs. Evaluating the effect of the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-1 beta in healthy and degenerative EBT cells, we verified that it boosts the expression uh, sorry, no, it's not this one. It's, sorry. Well, in the case of the expression of uh, dipokines, we can see that EL1 beta boosts the expression of uh, lipocalin 2, serpent 2, and PBEF that we can. Uh, uh, signal as inflammatory sensors, and we have a similar response uh, to IL-1 beta to healthy and degenerative disc cells. Here we have the effect of leptin alone, and we see no difference between uh, and stimulate cells and cells stimulated with leptin, so leptin had no effects. And here the combination of IL-1 beta and leptin, and we see no effects um, comparing to IOL, IL-1 beta alone. So uh, leptin didn't synergize uh, with IL-1 beta, as we have previously seen in articular uh, cartilage. Uh, for pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta boosts the, the expression of, of all the uh, inflammatory genes observed, as expected. And again, leptin has no effects alone, neither in combination with leptin comparing to IL-1 beta. And here we have the, the expression of metalloproteinases 9 and 13. And we see that IL-1 beta is able to increase the expression of metalloproteinase uh, 13, so it induces the degradation of extracellular matrix. And again, leptin has no effect comparing to unstimulated cells, and no effect comparing to IL-1 beta when put it in combination. Here we can find the, the heat maps in response to IL-1 beta, leptin, or the combination. And here we compare the data, all the data with unstimulated cells. We see it's as we have been uh, seen previously. IL-1 beta increases the the expression of inflammatory genes and has little or no effects on adipokines, 
and slightly reduces MMP9 expression, but without statistical significance. Leptin doesn't change significantly the, the gene expression, and there is no significant change between the profile of uh, leptin alone and, sorry, uh, between uh, the combination of IL-1 beta plus leptin and IL-1 beta. So we can say that we have a differential, a differential activity of leptin in articular cartilage and in intervertebral intra disc. So in summary, we reported that ghrelin, lip2, lipocalin2, progranulin, nuclear binding2, serpin2, visfatin, and cameroin are expressed in the, the intervertebral disc cells, either in nucleus and in anus fibrosis. The local production of these adipokines suggests that their importance in maintaining tissue homeostasis and thus their effects in intervertebral phys disc physiology and contribution to development and progression of disc degeneration furthers, deserves further attention. We also found that degenerated disc cells have decreased expression levels of LIP2 and lipocalin 2 so they could be could be our markers and new therapeutic targets of this degeneration. Uh, we found that the IL-1 beta increased the expression of all the pro-inflammatory genes analyzed and plus lipocalin CERP2 and MM. B13 with no effect on other adipokines. And we can say that circulating and local uh, levels of IL-1 beta contributed to trigger or and even perpetuate the degradation of extracellular metrics and disc inflammation. We also see that leptin has no effect on intervertebral disc cells for the analyzed genes, neither alone nor in combination with IL-1 beta, so differential activity in articular cartilage and intervertebral disc was found. Um, well, comparing with previous data reporting the effect of leptin in, in disc cells, we verified that these studies used uh, an higher uh, leptin concentration. So in the future, it will be important to determine the local concentration of adipokines in general and leptin in particular, as well as its correlations with circulating uh, levels of adipokines. Moreover, the expression of ghrelin, lip2, lipocalin, progranulin, NUCB2, serpin2, cameroin, and visfatin was demonstrated in healthy nucleus and annulus cells, as well in degenerated uh, disc cells. And determination of their biological activity and clinical relevance deserves further attention. And this is an important issue because currently the biological approaches aiming to regenerate intervertebral disc uh, will not succeed in a harmful and micro environment. So, to achieve this regeneration um, with biological approaches should be paralleled by strategies uh, aiming to ameliorate catabolic and inflammatory milieu of the intervertebral disc. So, my message is that Further understanding of the disease pathogens is fundamental for the discovery of much needed uh, early biomarkers and new therapeutic approaches to EVDD degeneration. Well, I would like to thank my former group in Santiago de Compostela, the NAIRID lab uh, led by Dr. 
Oreste Guadillo, and also to my uh, current group, my colleagues in Hospital Clinico de Valencia e, and in Cliva. And finally, <laughs> until we have early, bi early biomarkers and uh, treatments for this degeneration, my advice is have a, have a healthy lifestyle. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your time and your great presentation. Uh, is there any question? Uh, hi. I will try to formulate my question because I'm not from your area. But basically, how much is it genetics and how much is it environment so that uh, you may develop the this degeneration hyperinsulinism and so on that's of course uh, a disease is not only environment you also have a genetic basis and the problem is that you have the interaction of this multifactorial um, risk factors in a parallel way and it is very difficult to live with these multiple interactions. Mm. Okay. So it's not like you have some genes that make you more likely to have those things that you're doomed if you have a good lifestyle? Yes. I know that. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Vera, for your nurse presentation. I was wondering that you have mentioned that adipokines are produced by chondrocytes in the knee, in the articular yeah, cartilage. That's true. And I was wondering if you know specifically which what induces the expression of adipokines in such cells, because you said that they are expressed, but by who or what? Uh, the uh, adipokines are expressed mainly and uh, fundamentally by the adipose tissues. But uh, in the last years, uh, it was been recognized that other cells express uh, also adipokines. And what it's what we see, that intervertebral disc cells that are not adipocytes express these adipokines. And also in cartilage, the chondrocytes also express. So you have a local contribution, but, uh, but also uh, the contribution of circulating uh, depokines. So it is important next in the future experiments, uh, not only trying to correlate the, the circulating levels and the local levels of uh, depokines. So it's like, a fit forward loop that adipokines auto express itself more oh, okay okay yeah. so if there's no for example the um, inflammation does not contribute to the expression of adipokines it's just adipokines that it trigger the adipokines expression that's what you said you have both both, both. O yeah. also i don't know il1 beta tnf alpha and yes that's, okay. okay okay so thanks thank you Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. I have one comment and one question. The comment is that uh, more than 10 years ago, we had a European uh, consortium about uh, disc uh, regeneration, degeneration. It was the GenoDisc, with, uh, full with uh, high qualified uh, scientists. And uh, one of the aim was to find something that can regenerate the, the disc cells. And your one of your last slide, slide about the harmful environment can be the key, yes. I think, because what we found that that time, that a lot of uh, stem cells or, or, or uh, stimuli what uh, worked in the Petri dish didn't work in a more complex uh, uh, setup. So 
I think uh, in one hand the disc is very um, uh, very low in in, uh, in nutrition but the other can be the the environment uh, the other important issue could be the the environment uh, which is uh, reg regulated by this kind of cytokines adipokines and so on so i i'm very interested about the future of this kind of uh, uh, studies on the on the on the changing of this environment or modulating the the environment of the of the disc cells so congratulations and the question that uh, which can affect everybody the diet of a, of a human can somehow modulate or or, or influence the adipokine uh, expression of any kind of tissue in the body um yeah well primarily the diet affects the the adipose tissue and the dysfunction of adipose tissue but uh, we have to realize that adipose tissue is communicating with other organs like uh, the liver and the muscle that are essential in the control of, of metabolism so and these organs can also express adipokines. So we have uh, multiple sources of adipokines, and to complicate the scenario, uh, adipokines have also multiple functions, not only in, modul in modulating metabolism, but also in immune system. So, so we have uh, questions on Zoom. Is that will be read. Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask a question uh, from Christine Limet. And she's asking how much evidence is there that the adipokines migrate into the disc and influence the degeneration. So she says many of the factors are also produced by disc cells, as you showed. And how much do you think um, the increased risk from obesity is from increased load or from adipokine regulation? They don't seem to have any actions on the disc. Um, that's a problem because uh, the major problem is that there is no studies uh, correlating the circulating uh, levels of adipokines and the local levels of adipokines. So at the moment we know that local adipokines could have an effect, but we didn't didn't really know if the contribution uh, of circulating adipokines, if they could migrate to the disc or they only influence the metabolic and inflammatory status of the body and consequently the, the local uh, effect on, on the disc. I don't know if I answer the yeah, question. Might I ask a follow-up question? So um, how big are those adipokines and are they able, would they be able to come from the outside? through the cartilaginous end plate or would they migrate like in the blood, like how do they distribute? We would didn't they? know. You don't know? Yeah. Okay. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that uh, we have to realize that the, the communication or the irrigation of, of the intervertebral disc is compromised. So this could be also a factor that uh, that affects the the local levels uh, of adipokines or inflammatory uh, cells or mediators. All right. Any other question? Oh, what? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Go, please. Yeah. I want to ask a question because you said something about biomarkers. So, have you done any? rock curves or maybe assays with taking sensitivity, specificity about blood biomarkers, about how you can indicate someone having degeneration just from blood samples? No. Not right now? No. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's a very good point and a very interesting issue that it is important to, to see. Yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, maybe just one last question and then... Switch. Yeah. Mm. So um, I was wondering, according to you, what would be an effective strategy to find biomarkers for intervertebral degeneration, if not blood, 
for instance, um, disc samples from the patients? Or, um... uh, of course, we always ask uh, for biomarkers in the blood because it is more easy to assess than intervertebral disc. I think that no one wants that <laughs> and to you then in the disc, so, uh, so blood would be blood the best option be the, in the case. The like best, that. the best option, of course. Thank you. Maybe ah, last question from you. No, no. we don't have time. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Vera.